This Choircast podcast is proudly brought to you by R.J. the Astronaut by John Turney, published by Choir and available now. Join R.J. on his out-of-this-world journey filled with loving conversations, drama, and thought-provoking questions. Available now on Amazon.com. Get your copy and embark on an unforgettable adventure today. Dive into R.J.'s world where every moment sparks imagination and every page ignites curiosity. Don't miss out. Grab your copy now and soar beyond the stars with RJ. Hey, heathens, you're listening to the Deadly Faith Podcast where religion and crime collide. I'm Lacey. And I'm Lola. And this shit is heartbreaking. The mind that was in Jesus, that mind is in me. Without me, life has no meaning. Why would God tell you what I'm thinking and tell you what I've said to my wife or my husband when you're not around? It's because I'm the pastor of the church and I need to know. This is the only place where you can see truth. I don't want that. Are I you know. kidding me? This one's so sad. It really is. It's not like gory, but it's just, it's just sad, you know? <sighs> and... You know, yeah, it's, you'll understand the more we get through it, but it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking all the way around. I don't want to cry. I'm going to fucking cry. Anyways, welcome back, everybody. Welcome to another episode. Hope you liked last week's episode. I have no idea what it was because I can't remember and my brain turned off. (laughs) It was the Winklers. Yes, the Winklers. I'm sorry, guys. Today I did schoolwork for the first time in 13 years. I was doing statistics. Wheeling and dealing, but like not drugs. It's just knowledge. God God damn it. You know, okay, please tell me this is not, I'm not the only one that this happens to where you like hold on to something forever, like years you hold on to something. And then you're like, I haven't used this in X amount of time. I'm going to purge and you get rid of it. Uh And then like algebra shortly. Short, right. Shortly after you get rid of that said thing, you need that said thing. Yes. Like algebra. Ha- <laughs> okay. But no, like a physical thing. A physical fucking thing. Oh, we purge. Physical, like you physically hold on to something? Okay. You physically hold on to something. Like we have purged so many times with all the moves that we've done. And... What like, did the, you need so badly? This is something that like we, um, these are the last few, this happens just all the time, but these are the last couple that I can remember. My husband got rid of these like random ass fucking bolts he was holding on to since like the first state we ever lived in, Texas. We've lived like oh, five different states at this point. And he got rid of them the last state we lived in when we lived in South Idaho. Okay. And then when we moved to Tennessee shortly after moving here, he needed those fucking bolts. <laughs> Mm. And he didn't have it. He's like, I mm. just got rid of them. Okay. I had one of those graphing, those goddamn motherfucking <gasps> graphing calculators. Oh, no. I had yeah. held on to that motherfucker since I was in college. Okay. Yeah. If you don't they're know what a expensive. graphing calculator is, they're fucking expensive, especially the TI ones, the like Texas <gasps> Inst- <gasps> Instruments yes. ones. Those are like a hundred plus dollars. That's these my stupid favorite goddamn one. motherfucking calculators. I'm heated about this. You guys can tell. I didn't know I had a favorite graphing calculator until this moment, but those actually were yeah. my favorite in school. And they are the best ones because, you know, they're great quality, right? It's the Gucci of fucking calculators, all right? Mm -hmm. I had one and I held on to it. I'm pretty sure I threw that thing away, got rid of it, gave it to Goodwill, did something with it in the last six months. And I just started introduction to statistics. And you know what you need for this class? A fucking graphing calculator. So I just had to buy one because I'm a fucking idiot. I was like, really? This is why our parents hoarded everything. And I made fun of them for it, but I've kind of understand now, you know? (sighs) You know what? And being a homeowner makes it like so much easier to just hold on to shit. It really does. (sighs) Mm -hmm. And then like my grandparents, I used to look at their house and how full of shit it was. Every nook and cranny. I would just think like, why... Do you have this from 1977? Seriously. And then, like, they would be like, oh, well, I used it last year for this. And I'd be like, oh, what? Mm-hmm. What? I know. What is adulthood? You just use everything in your house? Because, <laughs> like, as a child, you use some things in your room, but not all of them. Most of the things you no. just, like, look at. Mm-hmm. I, we just started, like, my parents are, you know, they're not old, old, but they're getting on up there. You know, they got some medical issues. Shout so we out started, we to started the parents. We started asking them. Yeah. 
we started asking them, like, can you guys, like, please start going through your stuff and, like, weaning some of it out? Like, purge a little bit, please? Because, and she has. Like, my mom has really done a good job over the last couple of years, and it's still chock full. Like, it's still going to be a hot mess express for us to go through it when that time comes. But Mm -hmm. I'm just like, guys, this is a lot. But now I'm over here. If I wouldn't have thrown that away, I'd have a fucking graphing calculator. But you learn to purge, especially with our lifestyle that we lived for 10 years. Mm -hmm. You pay per square foot, basically, for a lot of these moves, especially our last one. So, like, if it's not essential, that shit's not coming. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think I'm just now kind of getting into the whole, like, I have shit now. Yes, same, because I own a house. I didn't have shit that, like, I lived out of a suitcase for, like, briefly homeless time, you know, like, Oh, with your last, college. with your last marriage? Mm, was this not with him? So like in call, co- so my mom kicked me out when I was eighteen. Bitch, she thought I was on drugs, even though she drug tested me and it was all clean. And I was like, I am not doing anything bad. And she's, like, I don't care, get out. To this day, she'll say, Oh, I never kicked you out. You just left. Not true. Oh, uh, uh-uh, uh, not uh-uh. true at all. Oh, oh, I, mm, I'll throw hands for you. But she told me, just pack what you can carry. She told me pack what you can carry and get out of the house. So I only had one duffel bag. So I literally just, I packed it full and then I like took my truck and just left. And so like in that time where I just was kind of couch surfing, like homeless and everything, it was like, I just learned to live out of a bag. And then my life became very, very simple. Like I did not have, things I had like essentials and that was it you were forced yeah yeah so now I'm like I I never thought about decorating my space I never thought about any of this stuff before and now it's like oh you can have tapestries you can have pretty lights you can have like uh a painting on the wall you know and like so now I have things and I'm like ah what do I do with these things now (laughs) oh my gosh I'm over here like yeah it's because I have a house and you're like yeah, it's because I'm healing from the time I was homeless. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, ah. I'm, your mom. I'm past fuck, it, yeah. If she's ever listening to this, I will throw some goddamn hands. She I'm just probably kidding. will that never That was a joke for legal this. purposes. I will never. I do not condone violence, but. If she could just mentally. <laughs> I, I, I'm a mother of three and I cannot imagine kicking my child out of the house. Even at 18, I don't fucking care. I am fully expecting my children to live with me not because like I want them to live with me as they get older or past the age of 18, but because of our economy, I don't fucking expect them to be able to survive oh, no. or financially afford, Mm-mm. not survive, but like financially afford yeah. living on their own, you know? So I cannot imagine kicking my child out. Yeah. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with like living in community. No, like not at all. I understand sometimes you don't get along with your parents and you got to get out of that space. That makes sense. But like, if it works, then it works. If everybody's pulling their weight, just whatever. We love community don't, living. Don't let people make fun of you because you live in your mama's basement. Bitch, in this economy, mm-hmm. fuck that. Live in your mama's basement. That's smart. That's just Ooh. smart than not being able Seriously. to eat. So, yeah. Shit, if something happens to my dad, my mom might be living in my basement. Like, I love that. That's probably what's <laughs> going to happen. I'm not even kidding. Actually, I told Tyler, like, you're going to lose your barn. No, I told Tyler, we have a barn outside. Like, it's a really nice barn. And he's like, he's going to be his wood workshop. I told him, I was like, that'll be my mom's house. We'll con- convert mm-hmm. it into a tiny house for it. It's actually like a huge, it'd be a huge tiny house. But mm. yeah. Anyways, well, now I said yeah. we're not going to talk your ear off, but actually I said that to Eric before we started recording. But anyways, I digress. <laughs> I digress. It is a smaller case today. Um, okay. And so we we'll, we can just jump right in. Right in. Today we're talking about the case of Lori Ruff, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, there are some trigger warnings. It's not gory, so don't don't worry. Yay. Um, but you're here for this, so like I don't really need to say that anyways. Trigger warning, sadness, apparently. So. Trigger warnings are mentions of miscarriage, declining mental health, suicide, family trauma, and in-law conflicts. So, 
We kind of go extensive on our trigger warnings. I know not everybody cut, like lists all those kinds it's of things, good but too. I like to. I like to. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about Lori Erica Kennedy. Now I'm going to tell this story the best I can. There are going to be a lot of times that it feels like I'm jumping big chunks of time. And it's because I am, because there's not an extensive like deep dive into this story. And so I'm going to share what I have and what we know and what's been released. But So, Lori was born October 15th of 1968, and in 2003, while attending church at Northwest Bible Church in Dallas, Texas, she met a man named John Blakely Ruff, who went by Blake. Blake grew up in a very well-off and prominent family down in Longview, Texas. Uh, In the 1930s, Blake's grandparents had gotten established in this area uh, during like the oil boom, and we all know oil in Texas Money, money, money. We love a good oil boom. Yeah. Um, they <laughs> they were very pos- prosperous in this, and they were financially set, which in turn made his parents become, you know, financially set, which in turn made him financially set. So for his parents, um, they ended up buying a bank and a real estate company. So they owned both of those. They bought a fucking bank. They bought a bank. Yeah, they. it says they own a bank. So I'm assuming that they bought a bank. I, I don't know that they like established a bank from the ground up. <sighs> I'm going to assume they bought it. The real estate company, I'm going to assume that they like established that from the ground up. I mm, could be wrong. Gotcha. Either way, Either way, they own a bank <laughs> and they own a real estate company. Nice. Both of those... Make great money. So, you know, mm. they're, they're good. They're, they're good. fine. <laughs> well, well taken care of. In this economy? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the family was also well respected um, by the townspeople, and they were considered to be pillars of their community. They were part of the local country club. The kids went to boarding school, and they were very close as a family, like a very close, tight knit family. Now, When it comes to Blake, um, he was described as not having much of an inner or outer monologue. His brother said that you could ask Blake one question and he would answer another. He stated that Blake wasn't trying to be evasive, but it was just who Blake was. And he was described him as, quote, different is what his brother described him, which I will say different is not bad. Different is just different. So I will say that. I don't like the whole he didn't have inner or outer monologue. What? (laughs) I I don't I, like that. <laughs> I it comes up later in the story, but Blake is a very just like straight shooter. Stoic. Like, I think probably pretty stoic. Very much a straight shooter. Like says it how it is. Very black and white type oh, okay. person. Gotcha. And so I think when he says like inner and outer monologue. Okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb here. I'm not trying to be an armchair diagnosis, you know, person. Be my armchair therapist for a day. I will say, from me digging into this and what, like, what has been shared, I would suspect that Blake is on, there is, like, somehow neurodivergent. Wherever he is in that and whatever it may be, I don't know. But I would think he is neurodivergent if you don't know what that is. ADHD, dyslexia, autism, Asperger's, which is just now known as under the autism umbrella, things like that. He seems, if I had to guess, maybe more on the autistic side of things, but he just seems like a very much black and white person. This is how it is. And so I don't think he has the like ins and outs of the like hardcore emotional stuff that we deal with as like other, not, you know, or like a neurotypical people. Mm-hmm. I could be completely wrong on this. This is just my guess. This is just my, you know, She's opinion. She's speculating. I am specs. highly speculating. Yes, highly, highly speculating. But ain't that just the way? I mean, I guess that's what he meant by like no inner and outer monologue. Okay. Now, after Blake and Lori started seeing each other, Blake's family wanted to meet her. So they all went out to lunch together. Now, unfortunately, this little meetup didn't go so well. Oh, <laughs> the shit. <family> asked, <laughs> yeah. The family asked Lori questions, just normal kind of like getting to know you type questions. And, um, Lori would avoid answering all of them, mostly. And by the end of the lunch, all that they knew about her was that she was an only child from Arizona. Both her parents were dead. She had no living relatives. And that she skipped high school and just got her GED before attending college. So that's all they knew. 
Not much. Okay. Not much. And now you have to remember this family comes from money that that is not only like Blake and his parents, but like his grandparents. So like it's a long line of money, kind of old money that's running in this family. So a very privileged life happens when you come from money. And so they started after this lunch to become highly suspicious of Lori from the get-go. They thought she's just after you for your money. Mm. I can I can kind of see where they're going with that. You know, like she's being evasive. This is a little odd. But their first assumption was she's after your money. So after this, they actually went to Blake and asked, like, encouraged him to break off this relationship with Lori. Based on one interaction with her? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my God. Not only that, I, I forgot to say this. So not only was it because they were suspicious of her and thinking that she was after his money, but also they thought that Blake was only with Lori and like wanting to be with her because David, his brother, had just recently gotten married. Because oh, apparently the, the thing was, well, David and Blake were twins, okay? And growing up, Blake always did what David did he would kind of mimic what he did. So like David bought a black Tahoe, Blake bought a black Tahoe. No. David had just met a girl at church and had gotten married. So now Blake's meeting a girl at church and it's getting serious. And they're like, is he just wanting to copy his brother? Is what he's thinking. Oh my God. This is is another reason where I'm like, he could have been on the neurodivergent scale because... Like, mimicking. if you're just copying, like, mimicking, masking, like, yeah. trying to be like, you know, this is what neurotypicalness is, and this is yeah. what society expects of me, so I'm going to mask, and how I'm going to do this is I'm going to, you know, just be how you're being. I can understand that. I'm very, I'm neurotypical, so, or I'm not, I'm neurodivergent, so I did that all growing up. Yeah. So there's just these little signs as somebody who is neurodivergent, I'm just picking up on. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong. I'm not a licensed therapist, so I have no idea, but... Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. not a licensed therapist, guys. Uh, since Blake, you know, met Lori at church, they're like, eh, you're trying to copy your brother. She threw us off. This is suspicious. So they were not having it. So they went to Blake and they listed out all their concerns with about Lori, but Blake wouldn't hear of it and he dismissed all of them. Good job, Blake. Clapping for you. Um, he tells them that Lori's just a private person and that doesn't like to talk about her past and that she had burned all her pictures from her childhood because she hated it. Oh. Blake's the type of person, like I said earlier, he takes what somebody says as truth. Like he takes what you say at face value. He's not okay. reading deep into things like we do. Like Tyler's like, oh, okay. And I'm thinking, oh, okay. Oh, okay, what? <laughs> So right, he just <laughs> analyzes. He doesn't overanalyze or under. It's no. just, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's very We're much We're doing our hands the same way. I know. You, just straightforward. So she tells him, I had a bad childhood. I didn't like it. I burnt all my pictures from my childhood. And he's like, oh, that's sad. I believe you. I take it as this. His parents and his family are like, what? Now again. Suspicious. 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 They- <laughs> They came from money, so they can't understand what a traumatic childhood is like. So much so that you burnt all of your pictures from your childhood that you don't want to remember shit from it. They can't comprehend that. And so their first thought is, no, you're, mm, there's something else going on. You're suspicious. I'm, I'm not okay with this. I smell lies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they never changed that opinion when it comes to Lori. Mm. When it comes to Blake and Lori, many said that they were like night and day different. Blake was very quiet and a shy person, while Lori was very loud, bubbly, kind of like strong-willed type person. They actually said that Lori was much more like Nancy, and Nancy is Blake's father. No, Nancy is Blake's mother, not father. Okay. (laughs) Nancy is Blake's mom. And people said that Nancy and Lori were basically like two peas in a pod. They had very much the same type personality. So we always know. How very Freud. Okay. Yeah. We always know how those like, this clash. You got two two strong-willed people coming at each other. Mm -hmm. And it does not end well. Oh, no. So... For Blake and Lori, their relationship moves very quickly. And within just a few months of, quote, courting, 
you don't know what courting is, it's like the Christian version of dating, just FYI. All you can do is hold Um, hands, if that. mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, they were already starting to talk about marriage. We all are not shocked. But Blake's parents were not having it, and they tried (laughs) to talk him out of it. But Blake, Blake, again, would not hear of it. He was like, no, no, no. And (laughs) it was very common knowledge that they had disapproved of this, you know, thing. And Lori and Blake knew that. So they were like, you know what? Fuck it. And they went off and got eloped at a church where it was just Blake, Lori, and the priest who married them. Oh. I know. I was like (sighs) shocked, but also very proud of Blake. Scandalous. Okay. I know. Like stepping out and being like, fuck you. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Do your own thing though. Deal with it. Get on. Get on and ride with us or we're leaving you behind. Mm -hmm. Now, as we all can guess, this pissed off the rough family, specifically the parents, you know, how <laughs> dare they, how dare they not Be only, adults with their own decision-making right? skills. Are you kidding me? Well, they weren't just mad that they weren't a part of the wedding, but they were also mad that they were not, they hadn't given their blessing to the nuptials. Oh. And so they were like, how dare you? Yeah. Now, over time, they kind of, I won't say um, mend it because it was always kind of like this weird, awkward tension. They never got along, but it was kind of that like, let bygones be bygones and let's just try to like live together. So it was kind of just like that. We know we don't agree and we know we're not like big fans of each other, but like we're still family. So let's move on. Get past let's it. move past this. Mm-hmm. Now, after the marriage, Blake's mom wants to put an announcement in the newspaper about their, you know, marriage. That's sweet. And Lori, very sweet, very old school Texas type, you know, coming from money, put your, you know, wedding announcement, you know, in the paper. It's society. But Lori said no. She put a stopper to that. She put her foot down. She said, no, I'm a private person. She even told Nancy that I'm a private person and I don't want my business out there for everybody. And Nancy did not like that. Mm-hmm. Again. Nancy is a very strong-willed person. And now you have Lori, an also strong-willed person that's coming against her and Nancy's not getting her way. And this is my opinion, but Nancy, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that she does not like when she doesn't get her way. Oh, And when really? she doesn't get her way, mm-hmm, she's going to do anything and everything she can to get her way. She doesn't seem very agreeable in general to me at this point. You will you will see this throughout this episode that she doesn't take accountability for her actions or her culpability in what happens, like at all whatsoever. Now, let's keep going. Quickly, after their union, um, Lori convinced Blake to move 90 minutes away to Leonard, Texas. So they lived in Longview and she wants to move away to Leonard, Texas. Blake grew up in Longview, and that has a population of around 90,000 people, while Leonard only has a population of 2,000. So, Oh, my God. Massive, massive difference. Like, we are talking small, tiny little Texas town. Everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows everybody's shit. Like, everyone's going (laughs) to see you. Everyone's going to know you. But it's also 90 minutes away from Blake's family. Mm. So... (laughs) Good news. I, you know... It seemed to me like Lori's wanting to move away. She convinces Blake to move away because she's trying to regain or have some kind of control over her family and her family's future without having the, you know, um, influence of his family. And I can understand that, especially by this point. She knows that you don't like her. The whole family doesn't like her. You're talking shit about her. You've tried to get Blake to break up with her multiple times. Like, Yeah, their marriage can't thrive in that kind of environment. You know, it's just not. Yeah, (sighs) it's honestly the healthiest thing for them. You know, like not to cut the family off, but to just have some distance. But just a little space, honestly, really will make a difference in a lot of relationships. So it does. I get it. It does. In Leonard, the couple kept to themselves for the most part. Blake would try to be neighborly and connect with others in the town. But Lori was said to be really like kind of reclusive and just 
she was focusing more on her and her family, which is fine. It was just her personality. Now, the neighbors would usually only see Lori at night um, walking around the perimeter of her property. They make that sound like super weird, but also I'm like, maybe she's just exercising at night. No, you know, maybe yeah. she's just like <sighs> walking at night, doesn't want to be out in the sun. Also, Texas is fucking hot. So like <sighs> most people wait till the evening um, or early, early morning to go out and do stuff. So like... It's kind of weird that she like, you said she kind of became more like introverted-ish, mm-hmm. you know? It's hard for me to believe that or to take that like super seriously because she also, which we'll talk about, I'm I'm literally about to talk about it. Um, let's just go to it. She joined a church in Leonard um, called the Fellowship Church, and she was very involved in this church. And they all said she was very energetic, and she always made people feel welcomed and she, it loved, and especially with like new people that would come and try the church. She was overly loving and affectionate and just a, and a heartwarming type person. Mama bear. <laughs> yeah. So it makes me like shocked that, not really shocked, but it makes me hard to believe that the neighbors would say like, we only saw her come out at night. Well, yeah, it's fucking Texas. Nobody goes out during the day, you know, like unless you want to get like mel of fucking Noma. It's, <laughs> it's so fucking hot, okay? If you don't live in Texas and you don't understand, but it's so fucking hot there. I just think they tried to make it sound weird when it's really not that weird. Okay, let's um, not put too much weight in that then. Yeah, and she was so active in her church. So I was like, nice. Mm, I'm going to just like mention that because it was said, but at the same time, I don't. Uh. Okay. You never saw her because she was never home. She was at the church or walking at night. So, ha. Yeah. Yeah. Jot that down. Now, um, one neighbor named Danny said that the entire six years he lived next to them, he only socialized with them one time and said that they stayed in their own little cocoon. No one really saw Lori during the day because she worked from home. She told people that she did like marketing consulting, but she in reality was a mystery shopper, which like I can get why she named it that makes it sound cooler, but she was a mystery shopper and also staying in their own little cocoon. Uh, Ditto. Like I don't really talk to a bunch of my neighbors except for the neighbors behind me. We do have a gate in our back fence that leads to their backyard because we love each other so much and we're great neighbors. But like, that's it. I've never had a neighbor that I just like chit chat with except for the house I live in now. You've lived in your house forever, so. I've lived here for like 15 years and I know everybody. We don't talk every day, but like. Yeah. If we saw each other outside, like, hey, how are you? You doing anything? All right, bye. (laughs) Yeah, but yeah. But also they were new. So like, they're still trying to. Makes sense. They're just not. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I said, they joined the fellowship church um, and Lori felt right at home. She used to go before this to a mega type church, but left it because she said she felt they didn't take the Bible seriously. You know what? Fucking ditto. Because (laughs) not that I'm a huge fan of the Bible, but mega churches, it is all about the show and it's all about the money and the numbers. And has it's like... It's very egotistical. It's not really about you're like pursuing your spiritual journey. It's about mm-hmm. showing out your spiritual uh, agreed. journey. So it's just, I I totally get where she's coming from on that. It doesn't feel as authentic sometimes. Oh yeah, agreed. So, so uh, many at Fellowship Church said that Lori was very upbeat and fun to be around. Like I said earlier, very, you know, loving to all the new people. I like Lori. <laughs> yeah, great person, just very kind. They also said that she was very religious. So she apparently told a Diane, a woman at church, that her parents had gotten divorced and her father was an atheist and womanizer. So she had nothing to do with her family anymore. Oh, okay. Now now remember this. Okay. And we will come back to it. Okay. Heard. So she was pretty religious, very much like if I had to guess, I would say like, more old school kind of Baptist, like by the Bible, what the Bible says goes, but also not like crazy fundamentalist, you know, like kind of in between those. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just you're like, no, yeah. I mean, (laughs) I get it. It's just straight down the line. It's like, yeah, we're a God fearing household, you know, but like you don't evangelize every single person you come across. Yes, exactly. That's what I would list her as. 
Now, from uh, time to time, uh, they would go back to Longview and visit Blake's family. Um, When they did, Nancy said that Lori was always on her computer and would rather be on the computer than socialize with the family. They said she never tried to integrate with his family instead of joining the other women in the kitchen to cook. (laughs) She would go take, take a nap. And... Nancy didn't like that. Go, girl. And I was like, come on. I go take a nap. Like, you don't fucking like her. You've made it well known that you don't fucking like her. You're suspicious of her. So I'm sure with her acting that way towards Lori, she may have like kind of unintentionally ostracized her, like with the other women in the family, you know? Yes. Yes. And so it's very much, it comes off when the story is told. It's very much like, I don't know. Like, we did everything we could, and she just didn't (laughs) integrate. It was like, you didn't like her from the beginning. And it's not like Blake is not telling Lori about the times you tried to get him to break up with her or not marry her or be mad that they eloped and, like, you didn't give up your blessings to the nuptials. You know, like, how do you think she would take this? What? Yeah. It's just crazy. Nancy said that Lori would collect the rough family recipes and even traced back their genealogy, which they all saw this as very odd. That sounds kind of cool. I feel like that's the kind of shit I would do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I was like, I love getting, you know, like with my mother-in-law. Some people just have different interests. Get over it. Yes. Nancy. I love it. I love asking my brother or my mother-in-law for recipes and stuff. And and even I would talk to his grandparents. I, uh, like his his grandma's not here anymore. His great, no, yeah, his grandma's not here anymore. No, it's his great grandma. Jesus Christ, he has such a big family. <laughs> but like his great, great grandpa and stuff. Or no, it's his grandpa. God damn, I can't give this straight. <laughs> Anyways, I would like to collect recipes. Whatever you say, we're gonna believe you. None of us are gonna look into this, Lacey. <laughs> anyways I loved asking them and like being interested in like their family history or asking stories and stuff or like it sounds really interesting to like trace the genealogy you know Mm -hmm. but they saw that as odd okay like well what does everything she do like you just label it as odd oh her farts are odd oh she (laughs) drinks water odd are you analyzing her shit she takes naps odd god damn sorry I'm being very aggressive with this but no, I Nancy, just the more I've told the story a few times, and the more I tell it, the more I get like very bitter towards Nancy. <laughs> I'll Good be Lord. honest. So I actually have in my notes. What do you think about Nancy so far in this story? <laughs> for yourself or for me? No, for you. For you. What do you think about Nancy? I think that Nancy is a bit pompous. Mm-hmm. I think Nancy is a bit egotistical. Mm-hmm. And maybe just a bit ignorant to different types of people <laughs> and yeah. general yeah. interest and uh, like autonomy over adult decisions. It just seems like she's not, she's not quite on the path. Yeah. I can tell she's not had to work a service job. I'll tell you that much. Absolutely. <laughs> And I, she doesn't understand trauma and how no. trauma affects, which like a lot, like a lot of people don't understand trauma and the depths of it. But if you've gone through something traumatic, then you have a deep understanding of trauma. And with that comes compassion and empathy for others who've walked through different kinds of trauma, even you if it is tell different me from what, what you went Lori. through. You got to tell me. I'm, I know we're getting there. <sighs> okay. Okay. So right after Blake and Lori got married, their number one goal was to have a baby. Ah, Unfortunately, it. it was very cute. But unfortunately, this was very hard for Lori. Mm. And she got pregnant time and time and time again. And every time it ended in a miscarriage. So she ended up having a total of four miscarriages. Mm. 
And that caused a lot of stress and a lot of tension within their marriage because, you know, getting pregnant was such a big deal to them. And now Mm -hmm. she's not, not only like she's getting pregnant, so they know it's not. But she just isn't able to carry to term. She's not able to carry to term. Yeah. And so it's just like, she's probably feeling defeated. It's just a lot of stress. It's never your fault when you have a miscarriage, you know. It's not, it's not your fault. And your body is not a bad body, so. Mm -mm. No. When Blake's family found out that Lori was struggling to maintain a pregnancy, they said, uh, oh, she's probably lying about her age then. Like, she's probably (gasps) a lot older than what she told us. Yes, legit, that was what they thought. Shut the fuck up, Nancy. Not kidding. Nancy, come here. Not kidding. Come here. Let's Mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. We have to. Yep. Yep. God. Lori, sweet Lori, struggled with infertility for four years years until she was finally able to maintain a pregnancy through IVF and she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl in 2008. Yes. And no, she had a baby. So her and Blake were over the moon, excited, and it felt like they were fo- finally overcoming years of tension and stress. Yeah. As they started their journey into parenthood, they both took it, took to it, like took to parenthood very well and were seen as excellent parents. Aww. Something that is just I mean, too fucking cute, is that Lori would dress herself and the baby up and take her out to tea regularly. I'm going to fucking cry. I know. How adorable. And again, this is another thing that we will come back to later in the episode. So just remember that she would take her out to tea and she'd get all dressed up, okay? Because it's so fucking cute. (laughs) Now, unfortunately, Blake's family saw Lori as overprotective. She wouldn't <gasps> let them. Mm-hmm. Why can't they go oh. away? <laughs> she wouldn't let them hold the baby. And she would even take the baby to the bathroom with her if she had to pee instead of just like letting somebody else hold the baby so she could go pee. So like valid, I will say she was a little overprotective. But again. I'm not a mom. I can't say. so. Again. If you have an understanding of trauma, you would instantly be like, okay, there's some kind of connection there of like why she's, there's a reason she's overprotective. Yeah. So the Ruff family was very family oriented and were part of each other's lives, every single one of them. They knew that they were this child's only set of grandparents. And so they wanted to be involved as much as they could. They would call um, and try to see if they could come to Longview or to Leonard and visit, but Lori would usually say no. The few times that they did come, um, Lori would not leave them alone with the baby, like at all. And they did not like this, again, at all. So this didn't help the family dynamics that were already, you know, very tense. And this tension just grew more and more. And they said that they felt like she hated them, and she did. Like, honestly, she did hate them or at least at the bare minimum, she didn't like them. She constantly complained about them to Blake, he said. And over time, Blake said that many of the times that she would complain about his parents, they hadn't even done anything. And so I think it had kind of like built up in Lori. And so... She's harboring that resentment over time. That makes sense. Yeah, she's not able to resolve it. And it's just now it's coming out and she just can't hold it back. And Blake, again, he loves his parents. Like they were a very family-oriented family. And so after dealing with this for so long and Lori becoming more and more, you know, just bitter towards his parents and making it very well known, he couldn't handle it anymore. And on Father's Day of 2010, when the baby was just two years old, Blake left Lori and moved in with his parents and filed for divorce. Now, they did split their time evenly with their daughter, but this was very hard for Lori. Like, I mean, heartbreaking hard for her. Um, She was being forced to separate from her daughter for long periods of time, and it started to affect her mentally. During the split, Lori and Blake did try to do marriage counseling with their neighbor, Danny, that guy I talked about earlier. He was a pastor at another church in town. I don't think he was the pastor of the same church that she went to. So from what has been shared about these counseling, like marriage counseling meetings, they were a bit odd. And here's where they were odd, okay? Sometimes Lori would come and it would just be her. Sometimes it would be Blake and Lori. 
And then sometimes it would be Lori, Blake, and David, his twin brother. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. At his marriage counseling sessions. What is happening? What? What is happening? Exactly. And even Danny, the guy was like, this is a bit odd. But apparently, David came and he, he wasn't just there. He would also speak on behalf of Blake. And he said that Blake was not able to like express his emotions very well. So David was there to do it for him. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I have questions. I don't know. Again, again, this is just one of those things for me that just, is this? Because okay, it's not yeah, neurotypical, yeah. you know? It's just mm-hmm. one, another, one of those things that's like, uh, yeah, eh, it, it leans that way for me. Possibly. Now, for the most part, these counseling sessions were just Lori. Um, Danny said that she would bring in notebooks upon notebooks and they would be full of writings and they were all just about how Lori needed to fix herself. She bared the weight of fixing their marriage and bringing their family back together. And she thought, all I have to do is fix myself and then everything else will be okay. He said that she would speak in circles and he stated that uh, Lori had even stated that she felt like it was Blake's parents who convinced him to divorce her and they were just trying to get Lori out of the way and take their daughter away from her. And this was just super devastating for her. And I can see where she's drawing that conclusion. Whether that's true or not, That's I can see where her mind's coming to that. It makes sense why she's thinking the way she's thinking. Mm-hmm. And talking in circles is a trauma response. Yep. She's trying to figure it out. Like, and the more you talk about it, you you feel like you're going to come to a conclusion or a solution at some point. And it's it's talking it in circles feels like you're going somewhere, even though you're not. It makes me think, so like my therapist tells me that like the way that I, I cope with certain things, uh, I it's like if your brain was a forest, and you had mm-hmm. like pathways through it, you know? Yeah. Say your coping mechanism is biting your nails. So like mm-hmm. that path in your brain is cleared because you bite your nails a lot. It's an easy, mm. you've already cleared the path. It's it's there yeah. to go to yeah. easily. So like, yeah, that and it's a trauma response in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, it can't be. It's not always. Sometimes biting your nails is just, is something else. But but sometimes it's a trauma response. And so you just do that. And if you don't have any other path to go down, you revert to what's already cleared away for you. So yeah, it's hard to clear other paths to make a new way for yourself and to find a different solution. So if you don't know how to find a solution or are not offered a new one, it's like, you have nowhere else to go, but like the same circles that you've been walking, the same path that you've been clearing away for years and years and years. So I don't know if that made sense, but that's that's how I take it. No, it does. It does. One of the many sad parts of this story that, in my opinion, is that Blake's parents took, like I said earlier, no responsibility for their actions or their part in their marriage falling apart. They said that the marriage fell apart because Lori was too protective and a gatekeeper over the baby. And Blake. And so that is why their marriage fell apart. That, <sighs> Excuse me. That's just gross. That's just gross. No. I'm sorry. She could be a gatekeeper over the baby. And, and yet if she had a loving and compassionate relationship with her in-laws, I don't see this marriage falling apart at all. Yeah. I don't think so either. Now, um, as the weeks passed, Lori started to unfortunately become unhinged being separated from her baby, being separated from Blake, and now having a divorce in the works was just too much for her to handle. She started sending mean, hateful, and even threatening texts to Blake and his family. When it was time for her to like hand over the baby to Blake, she would lose it and cause a huge scene, making it hard for every party involved. Mm -hmm. People also noticed that around this time, both Lori and her baby were losing weight and that her house was in shambles. And again, I'm not trying to armchair diagnose, but like it is clear she's dealing with some kind of mental upheaval right now. I would say at the minimum, some kind of depression. Like, it's, it's pretty bad in my opinion. 
Now, as time goes on, Blake's parents realized they were missing a house key and instantly believed that Lori was the one who stole it and thought she was planning to break in. One day, Nancy ended up hearing the back gate to their house open and close, um, and this was after the key went missing. So this put everybody on edge. Due to this, and Lori increasingly making a scene each time and sending threatening texts and stuff like that, they decided to apply for an order of protection against Lori, and it was granted. I will say with the threatening texts and all of that, and her starting to become unhinged, I can completely understand why you would order, have like an order of protection, but like also, why was nobody offering her help? Like, how about we go to a licensed professional, not the pastor for marriage counseling? Like, nobody helped. Nobody was like, we see your house is in shambles. You're losing weight. So and so's lo- the baby's losing weight. I wonder if they even asked her, becoming unhinged. Do you need no. help? No. Or like, how can we support you in this time? Mm -mm. In my opinion, absolutely not. I do not think they did. They didn't give a shit. Now, that same year after they got this order of protection, it was 2010. I think this is the same year that they, yeah, the same year they got, he left and got the filed for divorce. So this happened, that happened in Father's Day, whatever month that's in. So now we're at Christmas time of that same year. So months have passed and Lori has increasingly gotten worse. So a few days before Christmas, Lori met her neighbors um, and kept saying she couldn't believe she was going to be alone for Christmas. Around this same time, just a few days later, Blake's family was having a Christmas gathering and Lori came barging in and demanded that him and their child leave and come back to their home with her. She was demanding that their family be put back together. Now, of course, Blake refused and Lori had to be forcibly removed from their home. A few days later, Just before 7 a.m. on Christmas Eve, John Ruff, Blake's dad, opened their garage door to get the morning newspaper when he saw Lori's Lori's car in the driveway. He noticed that the lights were on and the car was on, but he couldn't see if there was anyone inside. So he just closed the garage door and called the Longview Police Department since they did have this order of protection against Lori. Now, police arrive and they approach the approach the vehicle and instantly see blood splattered in the center dashboard and Lori slumped over the driver's seat with a gun in her right hand. When they opened the car, they found two envelopes. One was addressed to Blake, my wonderful husband. The second was addressed to her daughter with instructions that she wasn't to read it till she was 18. Apparently, on Christmas Eve morning, Lori woke up and drove to Blake's family's home where she where Blake and her daughter were sleeping. She then parked in their driveway and with the car running and her seatbelt still on, she shot herself in the head, taking her own life. Now, the two letters they found have never been released in their entirety. Police have said that much of the letters are, quote, the ramblings of a clearly disturbed person. I find offense to that statement. I am highly offended. <laughs> that's, no. I, I don't think that's appropriate to say. It, whether or not it holds any truth, that, that's just not appropriate to say in this situation. She's not here to defend herself. Yeah. It, it's, why do that's you even gross. need to comment of, of about like the ramblings? Just say it was not necessary for us to disclose the full letter. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's the family's yeah. business. Period. Yeah. Like it was just do better they, simply. They were letter they were suicide letters to her, you know, they were her suicide notes to her loved ones. They're not for everybody. That's They're why just did not. you did to say that? The asshole. That's what, yeah. Well, the letter to Blake we do know was eleven pages long. So it was a very lengthy letter. Um, I think she did probably like talk in circles in the letters, but mm. you know. That's normal for her. In the letter, Lori said she didn't want to die being divorced from Blake so that she, so she was taking her own life so that she could still die being married to him because the divorce hadn't finalized. She mm. also stated that Blake, she wanted Blake to be the one to clean out the house. And she was very clear that no one else should go clean out the house. It was just Blake, nobody else. Now, <laughs> due to what has happened, Blake was actually inconsolable and he never stepped foot back in that house again. So he was not the one to go clean it out like she had asked. Now, Lori was laid to rest on January 3rd of 2011. Shortly after this, 
Miles, Blake's brother, and a few other family members went to Blake and Lori's home to go through stuff. But in reality, their motive was to find dirt on Lori. They they wanted to find some secrets and get get vindicated for all their suspicions on Lori throughout these years. They were even upset. So they were like, you know, not only wanting to be vindicated, but they were also just shows the this these people. They were upset that she killed herself in front of their house on Christmas Eve. They were not upset that she was dead. Okay. The, she they were upset that she did it at their house and on Christmas Eve. It was very much, oh, poor us, you ruined our Christmas. Not poor Lori. Her life was so so she was so she was struggling so much that she chose to end her life. Poor Lori. You, like I don't think they have compassion for anybody that's outside their family, in my opinion. <sighs> so yeah, I know, right? A lot. So um when they <laughs> when they uh got to Blake and Lori's home, Miles immediately called the police because he was afraid that Lori may have may have booby trapped the home. And so they wanted police to they wanted police to clear it. So like this just proves they really did think she was this like mastermind criminal on the run from police and and probably was had warrants out for arrest in seven countries. Like they had worked it up in their head that she was just this evil criminal on the run. Now, of course, the police come out and there's no booby traps. So they're allowed to go in. Now the house is a mess. There were bags of shredded documents, dirty dishes in the sink, clothes everywhere, and paper with writings upon writings upon writings like on top of each other. So like she would write a note and then on top of that note on the same piece of paper, she'd write another note and then write another note on top of that. Like, I I, I don't know any other way to describe it, but like she snapped. Like mm-hmm. she, her mental health had gotten so far, gone so far downhill that she at this point had basically snapped. She could not take it. Um, They even said that the baby's crib was even filthy. So if she's like neglecting the baby, like it, it had to have been, so, well, she ended her life. So we all know that it was like very bad for her to get to that point. Now, an interesting note is that Blake had told the family that Lori had told him that there was this lockbox that was labeled crafts that was in her closet, their closet in their bedroom, and that he was to never go into it. it the contents of this lockbox were private and personal and he was to never get into it, not, not open it. And Blake said, sure, babe. And he never tried to get into it. He never opened it. Hmm. He was just like, I believe you and it's your stuff. I will give you that space. Good man. Good job. I would have opened that fucking lockbox the first I would time have. my spouse would have I'm left curious. the damn house. I am too curious as fuck. You'd come home and be like, what are these scratches? I don't know. I didn't open it. Oh, it was a cat. We don't own a cat. Oh, cha. One got a in. wild cat just <laughs> ran in when I opened the door. A little bitch. Yeah, no. So when Miles gets the all clear from the cops, you know, and he goes in, he goes straight for this closet to find mm-hmm. this box. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. even commented after all of this and said, quote, so what do you think I did? I took a flathead screwdriver and broke that thing open. Like they just, they just want proof. You disrespectful mm-hmm. little. Mm-hmm. Goose knob. Now, inside this box, um, it held the beginnings of the mystery of Lori Ruff. Now, it's just the beginning, though. So, inside, they found an Idaho driver's license with the name Becky Sue Turner on it, but it had Lori's picture. So, that is not her name. They also found a birth certificate with the name Becky Sue Turner. They also found a bunch of scrap paper with random notes, um, random names, numbers, They also found a reference letter from a Roger Steinbeck written on stationery from a five-star hotel in Thailand. Um, It was like an employment reference type letter. They also found documents showing that Becky Sue Turner changed her name to Lori Kennedy in 1989. In this moment, the roughs felt vindicated, so much so that they all yelled out, bingo, Mm -mm. when they found this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now... Why was she, why did she change her name? Who was Becky Sue Turner and what was she hiding from? They needed to know, which, you know, valid. I would want to know too. So they go next door because literally right next door lived a private investigator and they immediately hired him to... Can I guess? 
Mm-hmm. Sure. I won't tell you if you're right or wrong. Well, she, I think she was in witness protection. Okay. Okay. That's not it. Based on your face, <laughs> that's not it. It was gonna. Be, it was gonna be my face, no matter what you said, because I want okay. you to go down this <laughs> rabbit hole of this story. I'm here. I'm so, ready. Um, they go hire the private investigator next door to dig into this because they're like, we need to know. So he digs into this um, and he finds Becky Sue Turner. But Becky Sue Turner was mentioned in a newspaper in 1971, but had died in a house fire at the age of two years old. So Becky Sue Turner is a dead person. And Lori had taken Becky's identity. That was as far as like, I think they probably found like a little bit more um, with this private investigator, but it was too much for him to really investigate any further. And so they passed it off to Joe Velling, which was a former social security investigator. And they gave him literally, the Ruff family gave him this three ring binder full of all the stuff that they had been able to uncover or like tell him the story of Lori and their experience with her. Now, um, since he like was in social security stuff, he investigated like stolen identities, credit card frauds, things like that. So they, he was pretty intrigued by this and he really honestly thought this was going to be an easy case. Like, you know, a a mom with a daughter, you know, just a church going woman, like this is going to be an easy open and shut case. I got this. Give it to me on Friday. By Monday, I'll have an answer kind of thing. (laughs) Boy, he was wrong. So, he was quickly able to piece together some of Lori's timeline, but before, like, before she met Blake, but he couldn't find anything prior to 1988. So we're going to start in 1988 and move forward from to what we know. So in May of 1988 in Bakersfield, California, Lori made a request for the birth certificate of Becky Sue Turner. It is speculated that Lori used the new paper trip handbook. This is the same um, handbook that we talked about in the, uh, what was it, the James Metheny and the Brother Terry case, where he like tried to change his identity. It's that same little handbook that teaches you how to change your identity. Okay. Um, so they think that she used the same one. It was written in the 70s. Now, if you don't remember from that episode, I'll give you just kind of a recap of like how easy it was to change your identity during these times. So what you would need to do back then is just get a birth certificate. And to get a birth certificate, you just needed to know the name and the um, date of birth of whoever you're trying to steal their identity of. Now you want somebody who is dead, but you also want them to be born in one state and dead in another state because they don't cross-reference. Those databases aren't cross-referenced, um, or at least they were back then. They probably are cross-referenced now. Actually, I don't fucking know. They probably aren't with our with knowing our how our system works. So that's how that works. And then you would request a, they would be like, cool, okay, you're just requesting this person's, and this is their date of birth. You're requesting their birth certificate awesome, we'll give it to you. You wouldn't have to show any kind of driver's license, proof of identity, like nothing. They'd be like, sounds legit. Give you the birth certificate. Then you would take that birth certificate to the office to get your social security number. Because back then, they only issued social security numbers when it was time for you to like go out and get a job. They didn't issue them at birth like they do now. So as long as the person died before, you know, of working age, then you could file for a social security card or a social security number. And most likely they had not filed for one in the past. And that is most likely exactly what Lori did in this case with Becky Sue Turner. So in June of 1988, Lori um, ended up getting an Idaho driver's license in Becky Sue Turner's name after she got that birth certificate. In July of 1988, Literally the next month, she got a Dallas, Texas. In Dallas, Texas, she changed the name of Becky Sue Turner to Lori Kennedy. She did that legally, like went through the legal system. Um, And she got a Texas driver's license and a social security number under Lori Kennedy's name. So, Hmm. yeah, I know, right? Like, and she also did it, she did all of this in like different states, like filed for the the, um, Becky Sue Turner's birth certificate in California, got the um, Idaho driver's license, the di- driver's license in Becky Sue Turner's name in Idaho, then changed the name in Dallas. And what was the got point? Her driver's license in Social Security. I'm so confused. 
I know, right? Um, so is everybody else at this point. In 1990, two years later, she got her GED from Dallas Community College. In 1997, she graduated from UT of Arlington with a degree in business administration. Joe also found that Lori had several P.O. boxes in several cities in several states. Her mail would just get rerouted through all these different P.O. boxes before it reached her in Texas. Now, Joe was concerned that she was some kind of Russian spy, so he tried to run her face through facial recognition and even ran her fingerprints through the FBI and Homeland Security databases, but it came back with nothing. (laughs) No, she was not a Russian spy. Uh, This just doesn't strike me as that kind of plan, but okay. No. Oh, my God. (laughs) Joe talked with Becky Sue Turner's parents and showed them a picture of Lori, but They didn't know her. They had no connection with um, this woman. He also spoke to Lori's friends in college, and they said that she mostly kept to herself and they didn't know anything about her. They spoke to her ex-boyfriend in college, and he said that the last he had heard was that she had spent time working as a dancer in a gentleman's club. Now, this shocked everybody because Lori's very religious. She's very conservative. She dresses very modestly. So people were like, what the fuck? Like, are we talking about the same person? But um, they did find out in the autopsy that she did have fake boobs. Now, does that mean that she was in a dancer at a gentleman's club? No. Do we know if she did? No, we don't. It's one person saying that she could have. This is not to say that dancing in a gentleman's club is not okay and not a valid, you know, form of employment. But I know that it would be very degrading to Lori's name. Like who she was at death is not, she wouldn't have done that. So. And at that point in time too. No shame. If she needed to do it, she did it, you know. But like, it just wasn't a respectable practice Mm -hmm. back in the day. Mm -hmm. And even like nowadays for a lot of people, Mm -hmm. But I don't see that as something negative towards no, Lori. I can, like, it is shocking when you see who she was, but also there's shit I've done in my past that's shocking. That's like, who the fuck were you? So we all have pasts. We all have done stuff we don't necessarily, like our future self doesn't necessarily agree with, um, whether other people agree or don't agree with it. So take it with a grain of salt. I don't really feel like it means much, but it was mentioned. So I thought I'd mention it as well. Now, on one of those papers um, in the box, it said North Hollywood Police, and it gave a phone number. It led to a man named Ben Perkins. I don't know why it said police, but it did lead back to a man named Ben Perkins, who was a lawyer that had been disbarred in the late 80s. He was contacted, and he said, I don't know Lori, I've never met her, and I've actually never had a white client. He only had um, people of color who were clients. The letterhead, uh, the employment letterhead that had the name Roger Steinbeck from Thailand, fake person, didn't lead anywhere. Then they ran her DNA through their genetic match system. Again, nothing. Then Joe submitted her DNA to the Nationwide Archive of Missing and Unidentified People and Ancestry.com. They were just hoping that one day some kind of match would help lead to some answer of who Lori was. After a year of searching, they were at dead ends. So Joe decided to turn to the media and the Seattle Times wrote their first article in late or in around 2013 about Lori. Now, the mystery of Lori captured the entire nation, if not the entire world. And people on the internet had to solve this mystery. It was everywhere talked about. Who is this woman? It was shared constantly. And theories were massive. They were thinking, did she see something she wasn't supposed to? Was she in witness protection? Was she on the run? Was she some part of like some kind of militia group? Was she running from an abusive partner partner, or like a traumatic or abusive childhood? There was, I mean, the spectrum was wide when it came to the theories. Joe said that in his opinion that she had to be running away from some kind of abusive relationship or something along those lines because through his research, There was no motive of gain for Lori. There was no financial gain. There were no scams, nothing. The only thing she got from doing this was some kind of freedom. And so that kind of gives you some idea. So in conclusion, she's not a bad person. And she didn't do anything Mm -hmm. that was like Mm -hmm. 
horrible. He, he, he did say J- Joe Velling. He was like, she had to have had help or she's like a master criminal. That was his opinion in the beginning when it was like he was coming up dry on all of this and couldn't find yeah, her. Yeah. He was like, she has to be like a master criminal or she had help hiding. Maybe you're just bad at your job, dude. You ever think about that? Like, or maybe it was just like really fucking easy to get, That's get another true. identity in the 70s and 80s. Maybe this is just the wrong time to be a PI, man. Right, right. Yeah. But later on, after they did more, you know, uncovering, he was like, she had to be just like trying to find freedom. So the internet also tried to comparing her to many different missing people. They they try to tie her to many different like true crime unsolved cases. Again, Mm -hmm. none of them were solid or led anywhere. Until Colleen Fitzpatrick, a nuclear physicist turned forensic genealogist, she approached the mystery with science. She got a sample of Lori and Blake's daughter's DNA along with Blake's. She then sequenced the DNA and remove, removed Blake's uh, and isolated Lori's. With this, she then started to map out a family tree to trace Lori's relatives. Colleen is very amazing at this. Um, she's been able to help adoptees find their birth parents, estate lawyers track down heirs, Holocaust survivors search for family members, and even was able to find the identity of a child who had died on the Titanic in 1912 by tracing his ancestry through his relative's DNA. Wow. I mean, wild. Go off. Mm-hmm. I am not going to act like I know what the fuck I'm talking about, okay? I was able to put this script together. I do not know how all this works. So just bear with me and just follow me down this rabbit hole. Gotcha. (laughs) Now, at first, she was only finding distant cousins and they wouldn't be much of help identifying Lori. But then one person came up as a first cousin. It was a man named Michael Cassidy. That was the only information given. Um, Many people have the name of Michael Cassidy and they couldn't narrow down who the right Michael Cassidy was, like who the right one was. And they tried to contact this Michael Cassidy through the genealogy website that they matched through, but they got no response because a lot of people like do these DNA tests and they check it and they're like, oh, that's cool. And then they don't ever go back to it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what happened in this situation. So again, another dead end and everyone waited. Like she had mapped out as far as she could. She was just waiting for more people to do their DNA and something to link up. Years passed when all of a sudden the name of a third cousin popped up. It was too much of a separation, but it gave her enough to provide clues about Lori's family tree. She had the, she then created a family tree based off the third cousin's ancestry. She tracked it back to a great great grandfather who was born in 1848. Then she traced that family tree all the way down another branch till she came to Michael Cassidy. She now had Lori's extended family in front of her. With this information, she was able to narrow down the correct Michael Cassidy through Facebook, online obituaries, public records, and people finding tools that like private investigators use. She was able to piece together this whole Cassidy family. She had thought that Lori's mom was one of Michael Cassidy's aunts, but there was no way that she could know for sure. So she gives all this information over to Joe Welling, Velling, and he flew to Philadelphia in March of 2016. He, for some reason, I'm not sure why he did this, but he decided not to go to Michael Cassidy first. He went to a different family member and he went to their work and he walks in and he's like, I have a story to tell you. <laughs> And then he pulls Hmm. out a picture of Lori and the family member immediately goes, oh my God, that's Kimberly. Kimberly McLean. Lori Ruff was actually Kimberly McLean. So who is Kimberly McLean? Kimberly Kimberly McLean grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Also, I just wish everybody could see Lois' face. She was just like, huh? (laughs) I I feel like I'm... Having an aneurysm. I'm taking you on more, a roller coaster. I, I can't I t- talk. I need, tell me what's <laughs> happening. Tell me, God. Okay, okay. So she grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she was born October 16th, 1968, less than a year before Becky Sue Turner was born. So thanks, Nancy. She was pretty much the same age she told you. So like, fuck off. <laughs> Fuck you, Nancy. <laughs> All Lori went to Lori went to Bishop McDevitt High School and was a senior in 1983. 
Lori up and vanished her senior year, and one of her former classmates said, so sad, hardly anyone remembered her and no one knew why she left. Like I said, this case is fucking heartbreaking. After graduation, a classmate had heard that Lori had moved to King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, And she had called her mom and told her that she was leaving and she did not want to be found. Her family never called the police um, or filed a missing persons report. She was 18 and left on her own accord. So even if they did do that, honestly, there was nothing that the police could do. She's an adult. You're allowed to go missing. You're allowed to run away Mm -hmm. if you want to. The family said they didn't know why she just stepped and left. They had no idea. In 2016, this is around like September of 2016, where um, Lori was finally like identified as Kimberly McLean. Lori's mom refused to talk to the media, but her uncle did start saying, like, speak out and talk about the family. Um, and they, he said it was a, just a typical family. They were great. Sunshine and rainbows. We have no idea what happened, right? He said the mom, Deanne, stayed home and raised the kids, and the father worked in construction and also volunteered at the fire department. Lori had an older sister, Michelle, and they had a happy childhood with vacations, fun memories, day trips, and family dinners nightly. The father would even give the girls rides on the fire truck and had built a nice playhouse in the backyard for them. So, I, it's a mystery, okay? But others painted a very different picture. We all saw that coming. (laughs) Teresa Montgomery knew Lori since the fifth grade and said that there was no camaraderie between the family members in Lori's home. She went to their house one day when they were kids and said that when she walked in, it felt very cold and distant instead of warm and fuzzy like she was used to at her house and even at her other friends' houses that she went to. She said it just the atmosphere was vastly different. Louie was a neighbor of the family and was friends with Lori's mom for 10 years. Louie had a daughter that was around the same age as Lori and Michelle, and they all played together. Louie said that um, Lori was always kind of a loner, and she always wanted to play alone. She was regularly found playing by herself, which is fine. That's just who she was. Louie also said that Jim, uh, the father, and Deanne had a very dysfunctional relationship. Jim was very controlling and Deanne had no freedom. She even said that she told Deanne that she didn't think their marriage was a healthy environment for the children and for her. Louie did know that Jim was also an alcoholic and since he was controlling, she didn't think it was much of a stretch to say that he could have been abusive in some way. Shout out to this pastor. We're about to talk about like an amazing pastor who did the right thing. Doesn't happen a whole lot of times in these stories, but like, congratulations, it's happening now. Deanne uh, told Luis that she had spoken to her pastor and asked what she should do. And he told her to save money, don't tell anyone anything and get out of there. So that kind of makes me think that there was probably some kind of like more like abuse type stuff going on if this is what the pastor's saying. And so that's what Deanne did. One day without telling anyone, she packed up the kids and she left, which good job. Glad she did that. Uh, a few years later, she met a name named a man named Robert uh, Becker, um, and they ended up moving away and living with this guy. And he, they got married, kind of thing. Um, and that's where Lori, Kimberly, and Michelle went to Bishop McDevitt High School. The uncle thinks that Lori ran away because she struggled to adjust to this new life, and he couldn't think of any other reason why. Because her life was so great. Mm. I'm not going to say that he was being like ingenuine. I just think that there was probably more going on in that home than he knew about because he was an uncle. And I'm sorry, their life was not great. You don't up and run away and change your whole identity because your life was great. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I wouldn't. No. No. No, You're like, no, not at all. This is... You told me it was heartbreaking. And I literally feel in my chest like an ache. I know. For her. This is one of those stories that, like, we have answers, you know, for the most part, but it does not leave me. Like, I think about this case all the time. And I'll I'll tell you more of why I think about it a lot. But after Lori runs away, the, I think it was like the very next year. So she vanished in 1986. And a year later, um, her father, Jim, he died and he left his estate to his two daughters, Lori and Michelle. 
Um, this totaled to about $84,000 to each of the two girls. Can you really Google really quick what $84,000 uh, is today? Um, this would have been 1987. So $84,000 in 1987 is what today? So each of them would have gotten that much money. The people in charge of the estate tried to track Kimberly down um, and ended up finding her address because she hadn't changed her name yet. And she was living in Utah at this time. Do you find it? $225,619. Fuck me. So okay. like almost. Remember that? Quarter, quarter of a million dollars. million dollars. Holy fuck. One trip down to see the Titanic. I'm sorry. I just made that reference. <laughs> <laughs> the, the submarine that that exploded oh, that's, that's how much right. a ticket was oh shit <laughs> like, what are you talking about i forgot about that um, i know right mm. so they tracked her down she was like i said living in, under her real name so it wasn't hard and they ended up sending her a letter to inform her of her father's passing and the fact that she had inherited a lot of money shortly after this letter was sent was when Lori took the identity of little girl Becky Sue Turner and disappeared. She never collected that $84,000, which would have been a quarter of a million dollars today. She, I'm sorry, you did not have a good childhood if you don't even want the money from your dead father this summer. Something much. bad happened. Something, something bad. And that's the, we don't need to know what happened, but I am curious. I already know what happened. I when have her my kids alone. Wouldn't leave her kids anywhere that she couldn't see them and make sure that they were safe. Mm-hmm. And the and the the fact that she constantly or she was like reliving her childhood with her daughter. Like she dressed mm-hmm. up herself and took her to the tea party. She was she was doing inner child healing, not even realizing that's what she was doing in those moments. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so, yeah, that is the story I have of to... Lori, Erica Kennedy, actually Kimberly McLean. <sighs> mm-hmm. I have to read you some song lyrics real quick that fit this to a T. Okay. Taylor Swift, Mad Woman. Of course. Of course, T Swift. Here we are. Listen, it's not even a joke. Like this is every time you call me crazy, I get more crazy. What about that? And when you say I seem angry, I get more angry. And there's nothing like a mad woman. What a shame she went mad. No one likes a mad woman. You made her like that. And you'll poke that bear until her claws come out and you'll find something to wrap your noose around. And there's nothing like a mad woman. Fuck me. If that is, like, if she wrote that for Lori. Like, that's it. It it is so hard to be a woman. And Mm -hmm. she blew her fucking brains out. Mm -hmm. I will say, like, I think that it she did it in their driveway on purpose because she was pissed. She wanted them to know you're the ones that, that... Mm-hmm. put me to this point like I was a good person you kept poking and poking and poking mm-hmm. and like you wouldn't leave me alone about all these things and you criticized me you talked shit about me you won't just let me make my own decisions and be my own person I finally found freedom and I can't even have it and like enjoy it yeah and they're the ones that released this story with Joe Velling like they released this expecting the world to be like oh my God, and like all of this come out and like trying, like finding her actual identity years later and it just like then be vindicated when in reality, it made them look like pieces of shit. Good, yeah. That's... It really did. Now, even before <sighs> like when this story first came out, before they actually found Lori's identity, they did, uh, Blake said, and I'll read his quote, maybe she wasn't even comfortable around herself. How would she be comfortable around the family? I'm assuming something really tragic must have happened. Something awful is what it appears to me. He said that before, I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correctly, he said that before her, even her identity of Kimberly McLean had been found. And it's like, I don't know, maybe listen to fucking Blake more. He might be quiet, he might be shy, but he knows a fucking thing. He trusted her. 
He trusted he her. He didn't even open the goddamn was. box. Like he, yes, he knew her on a deeper level, but because you had your suspicions and you poked this goddamn bear. And this is one of those stories that like, I'm so passionate about telling because that little girl is still alive. And mm-hmm. she was born in what, 2008? So that makes her shit, 2008. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Shit, she's 16. She is 16. So I hope that with how many times this case has been covered, that it it has done Lori justice Mm -hmm. in the sense of like her daughter is really able to see who her mom really was. We don't have to have all the answers to why she did what she did or what happened to her to know that she did everything in her life to protect her child and to protect herself and her family. And I hope that she comes to that, you know, one day. Because, like I said, fucking heartbreaking. God. I know. I'm fucking I'm sorry. Like, my oh, eyes are fucking I'm watering. So Sorry. I I just I know. Ah, it's a, it's hard it's hard not to feel. It's not something that can be righted. Like it's not nothing can be I fucking hate his family and they're not fully to blame but like it's like they were the catalyst for this whole fucking suicide. Mhm. And I I, just, I get it. Money there is a privilege when it comes to money. And they came from like a long history of money, you know, from the 30s up. So like in my head, that's a long history of money. That's multiple generations of having the privilege of wealth. And there's a lot of life experiences that that teaches you compassion and empathy when you grow up paycheck to paycheck, when your bills are about to be shut off, when you're fucking homeless, when you've went through really traumatic shit. Not to say they didn't go through any kinds of like trauma or that their life was perfect. They had hardships. They just never had hardships that like forced them to look at their own humanity in a different way or force them to reframe the way that they think about other people. Uh And that other people could be hurting in a worse way than them. She was not after Blake's money. She didn't even take the quarter of a million dollars from her own father. She was a good person. I hope that they, I I know this sounds like super evil, but I hope they feel guilty. I hope that they feel remorse for, because the internet was not nice. We have not been nice to them in this episode. So you know they've been torn to shit. I hope that they're nice. I hope that they're like, are nice to her daughter. And I hope that they are... Oh, I think they're super nice to her daughter. Remorseful, yeah. Like for for what they did, I hope that they like the. I hope they've grown. Oh yeah, I hope that they've grown too. I hope they've changed. Sure. I hope things are different, and it is all come to some healing. I hope that Blake will only focus on the good part of their marriage. Hmm. Um, I I could finding this out and like knowing all of that about my spouse. I I think all the bad, like I say, bad things that she did, like the evil, evil, the mean texts or the threats and like everything. Like I would just, I'd be able to throw that out and just look past all of it. I think knowing what she's yeah cuz she i think she really did let him in on a lot even though she didn't like reveal her past i think like mm-hmm. him just having that deep connection with her he, like you said he trusted yeah. her so he did trust her wholeheartedly what a night mm. what a I night no all right no one Before likes a mad woman keep bringing you down the, <sighs> the sad sad path that we told you about today i'm just i'm a very emotional gal. I know. That's you know okay. I get. It's all right. What's your palate cleanser for today? Let's just segue right into that. We never have good segues, but we're jumping ship and jumping right into a new one. <laughs> My palate cleanser. I don't have one. I have to you go to the good one. news. I have to go to the good oh. news. <laughs> okay. I have one. I, for the first time in 13 years today, well, I did two things that I haven't done in 13 years. I did homework today. I did math homework. 
and I actually crushed it. It's just really well. Oh my god! And I also go you. No, thank you, thank you. Um, I also I put on my snowboard and I, <laughs> I snowboarded down my little hill in my backyard. <laughs> I literally oh, like yeah, yeah, yeah. took a sh- it was great. Said, it was a great video. I was, I'm not an amazing snowboarder by any means. I've only been a few times. Um, but I've we've I've had a board for literally uh, my entire marriage. But I've either been pregnant or we just like haven't been able to afford going to the mountains or we haven't lived by mountains or our kids aren't, you know, we don't have a babysitter for our kids. There's always been something in the way. And so, but we have trekked them around with us for every every state we've lived in. And today uh, my kids were sledding because if we live in Tennessee, everything's a fucking hill. Your backyard's a hill. Your house is built on a hill. Everything's a hill. So that is a really good thing when it comes to, you know, this kind of weather. And so they were sledding down and I sled down with them a couple of times. And I just was like, I have to go get my board. So I went and got my snowboard. At first I tried to <laughs> snowboard down in uh, rain boots. Yeah, that did not work. I fell like 13 times and my backyard is oh, not God. that big. <laughs> so then I called my husband and he was like, I was like, do you have snowboard boots? Because I knew I didn't. He's like, yes. And so I went and stole his. And then I went down like four times. And that was all I could do because I was, I, was, I was sweating a little bit. <laughs> No, I just, you <laughs> have more fun, guts though. than I do. That's for <laughs> it sure. It was fun. I, okay, I only snowboard because, um, not only, but I wanted to snowboard, um, but I kind of was going back and forth between snowboarding and skiing the first time I went. But the reason I chose snowboarding was one of the leaders at our church told me that like, he was like, yeah, like snowboarding, it just like, you're going to get to the end of the mountain and your thighs are going to be burning. And it's just like, it's a lot of work. And I was like, oh, is that what happens to you? And he goes, no, but I'm a guy. And I said, I'm going to snowboard you, motherfucker. And I did. And I fucking creamed everyone. At the end of that, um, I like showed everybody up. Every, not showed everybody up, but like showed them what I was yeah, made yeah. of. And at the end of it, my pastor even told me, he's like, I saw a new side of you. I was like, yeah, don't tell me I can't fucking do something, asshole. I love that. <laughs> I know. She's got that spirit. (laughs) Got that good spirit. Okay, I have my palate cleanser. What's yours? There were zero airline crashes in 2023. Shut your damn face. Zero. It was one of aviation's safest years ever. So uh, 2023 was the safest year in aviation history with no large turbofan-powered jet aircraft being involved in anything resembling a crash anywhere on Earth, meaning that scenario just laid out, took place tens of thousands of times every day for 365 years without a single fatal crash or collision. So are we talking aviation in general or like major airlines? Aviation in general. Shut up. That's so it looks like amazing. there were just two losses of life occurring from inside the plane. Uh, you know, like okay. two people died on planes. But like, okay. in general, no one died due to Be, like a crash, a plane crash. or yeah, yeah, yeah. anything like that. So, yeah. So it was like they had a heart attack or something. And, and yeah, yeah, not yeah. that that's not a yeah. bad thing. Yeah. Oh, my, my two losses, though. I mean, yeah, this is pretty dang good. That, and um, that's on the Good News Network. And in, in case any of you guys need some good news, every single day it's updated with some good news. Every single day. Look it up. It has good news. I love that. That's that's saying something because have you guys heard some of the crazy stories, crazy <sighs> airline stories that have happened in the last just year? It's we don't have time for this. We're, we're not, not going to. No, Google we're leaving it. this on I'm a not, good note. I'm it's not, a good I'm not gonna, Oh, they're not. They're not. Well, most of the ones I'm thinking of, they're not wild bad. They're like wild funny. And it's like, dude, really? I don't you want wild funny crazy. on a plane. I've never been mm-hmm. on a plane. I'm so nervous to be on You've a plane. never flown? No. I've never been on. Oh, my gosh. I've never been on a major boat. I've never been on a airplane. I bet I can canoe like a son of a bitch. <laughs> I can like, canoe you like don't a even realize. You know, I can. <laughs> I can canoe. And I can kayak like a motherfucker. That's hilarious. Get out of my way. I'm here for the rapids. You know, I'm that's one of funny. Those. See, I, I see. I struggle with those, but I've been on a plane. I've been on multiple different planes. I've been on like a little Cessna. I think we've talked about this. Been on like yeah, a little yeah. little Cessna plane. The family I lived with in college, they had one, and so cute. It was it was very 
it's very fun. Um, and I've been on a lot of different boats. I haven't been on a cruise ship, but I've been on a, like a um, big, like I think the biggest one I've ever been on was when I went from South or yeah, South New Zealand to North New Zealand. And you, it's like a huge ass motherfucking ferry. <sighs> She's it's so long, cool. Just flex so, on us. Dude. New Zealand. Uh, my university Ventures. paid for 99% of that trip, but. It was amazing. And you know what? You got to be where the hobbits were, and I just, I, I don't, did. I'm very I upset. I did, but I didn't get to actually go and see the hobbit stuff, which was really okay. sad. I saw it in the distance when we drove past. Oh, still. It was like, and, and I say distant, distant. It was, but I still got Breathe to see it. Breathe the same it. air it counted, okay? I did. <laughs> and it was so fun. I loved, I loved those trips. Get cultured, go travel. Yeah, 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 for sure. Touch some grass, drink water, but we'll we'll see um, you guys next time. Yeah. We'll see ya. Bye. Bye. Hey, humans, if you're enjoying the show so far, please remember to like, subscribe, follow, review us. Send us a question. Send us a, I mean, anything, really. That would be fine. Deadly Faith is brought to you by Quiricast Network. It's produced by Lacey Bean and Lola Robinson. Audio engineered by Eric Howell. Thanks for listening.